You're not from Vancouver. You grew up in Montreal. Um, in 2003, you, graduate, you graduated from university there. What made you come to Vancouver? How do you know when I graduate from university? I do my research. Wow, I'm kind of like a psychic here. <laughs> I, um, what made me move here is I was doing a lot of uh, theater in Montreal, and uh, my degree was, you probably know what my degree is in, right? I don't, actually. Oh, wow, okay. She knows what year. I did a degree in communication studies from uh, Concordia, and uh, I wanted to work more in film and television, so I moved to Vancouver and, of course, immediately started doing theater as soon as I moved here. Now, speaking of theater, you have a project that you're working on on your own. Um, it's a hip-hop piece. Yeah. Can you tell me a bit about it? I can. It's a, a hip-hop theater piece uh, with a company called Urban Inc. called The Lamentable Tragedy of Sal Capone. So, like, in an, an alternate life, when I'm not uh, doing TV stuff, I'm a writer. So this kid was shot by uh, police in Montreal. His name is Freddie Villanueva. And I wanted to write a play that explored how those situations happen. Because obviously, you know, I'm one of my best friends is a cop, and I know that cops aren't just hunting children. So I was like, what, what, situa what factors would have to happen for that to, uh, a situation like that to occur? So. And you've written it all on your own? I have. I wrote, uh, I wrote it on my own, except there's songs in the piece that I wrote the lyrics for, but I'm, I work with a producer and uh, a friend of mine who's an incredible uh, MC named Kia Kadiri. She's a female rapper, and we collaborate together on the songs in the piece. But other than that, it's all me. Are you also the star? I am not the star. The character in the play is uh, 19 years old. And I, I suppose I could have stretched. It's theater, right? These things happen. But, you know, I'm 32. And uh, they, the role calls for somebody who's, like, young and idealistic and preferably a break dancer and whatever. And, you know, I don't think I'm <laughs> quite as agile <laughs> as, I, as I used to be. So. And is it a musical? It's not a musical, but there are elements of music in it. Like, we're hoping to have the sound design be done by a beatboxer, and uh, there's three or four hip-hop pieces performed in the play. There's also spoken word pieces, and there'll be a, a scratch DJ who does some stuff in the, the piece as well. Very cool. Now, speaking of spoken word, um, you're a slam poet. Can you explain what that is? A slam poet is a poet who performs poetry that's meant to be listened to by a live, a live audience. So I think it started in New York. I don't know if it, if it did, but it's basically like a form of poetry that's competitive with an emphasis on like engaging the crowd. And there's all these rules, like it's like three minutes uh, long for pieces with like a 15 second grace period. And there's a huge actually scene in Vancouver at uh, Café du Soleil, Monday nights. There's uh, spoken word poetry nights. So. And are you there most Mondays? I'm not, not as much as I'd like to be. I, like a lot of my friends are, are very active in the community, but because, you know, acting is my primary source of income, that's how I like pay my bills, I'm more focused on that. But whenever I get a chance to go either listen or perform, uh, I do. And also Urban Inc., the company where I'm currently artist in residence, who's producing the play that I wrote, we had, had our own uh, slam love spoken word thing in February uh, for Valentine's Day. Well, it was for Valentine's Day and Black History Month. And how do you get the word out about that? Honestly, mainly like Facebook. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Like, yeah, like Facebook and Twitter. We just like use a lot of social media, and it was great. We had, we had a great turnout. Now, in saying that your primary uh, money-making business, I suppose, mm -hmm. um, is acting, you're in, I would say, a show that has taken Canada by storm. Mm -hmm. um, Continuum has had write-ups saying that it's second to Games of Thrones. Let's knock on wood for a second. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. I totally understand. Um, saying that second to Games of Thrones is huge because I don't think a lot of people realize, but it's only been released in Canada. What's it like to be a part of a show that has such a huge following already? Honestly, it's like it's pretty surreal, and I don't think the impact is fully sunk in yet because it's just two episodes of aired, mm -hmm. and I haven't like. We have. I haven't gone to any like sci-fi conventions or anything yet, and I'm a, I'm a big sci-fi fan. I love comic books and all that stuff. So, for the nerd in me, it's like really exciting. But it hasn't been as weird as I think it's going to be yet because the show's just coming out. But it's. Uh, I feel really blessed and I feel really lucky to be part of a great show. And the you know the cast and crew are all really nice people, and we all get along. So, can you give us a bit of a synopsis of the show? Sure. Yeah. Uh, the show is called Continuum, and it's uh, airs on Showcase. And the premise is, there is, in the future in Vancouver, 2077, 
the country or the world really is run by corporations. So all the big corporations went and bought every country's debt. And as a result, everybody in the future kind of has to work for these corporations like for their entire lives. I play a character named Lucas Ingram who's part of a, what's considered a terrorist group called, called Liberate. And we want to free everyone in society from like this corporate rulership. So the show, uh, the first episode in the show, me and I think it's six other of the, the world's most like feared terrorists are about to be executed because what we did is we blew up uh, the heads or we tried to kill the heads of all these corporations. And as a result, we accidentally killed a couple hundred thousand people with it. That's a little bit of damage. Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit of damage. We're not nice guys. <laughs> we might, we might, we're out of our heart in the right place, but we're, we're a bit extreme, right? So the show is about... We, right before we're about to be killed on or executed on uh, TV, my character invented this time machine that the second we're about to get killed, this explosion happens, and the terrorists go back in time, and we're hoping to stop the corporate future that we're from from happening. But this cop, who's played by the amazing and beautiful Rachel Nichols, uh, follows us back in time. So the show deals with us trying to like cause trouble in the past to stop our future from happening. And the hero of the show is Kira Cameron, played by Rachel Nichols, who's trying to stop us from killing more people. Okay. Was that clear? <laughs> it was, yeah. <laughs> now, talking about time travel, if you could pick any day, any year, is there one specific that sticks out that you would like to go back to? And what would you do? Hmm. This might seem like a cop-out, but like I think life's pretty sweet right now. You know, I'm healthy, I'm happy, I'm inspired, my family's all healthy got a beautiful niece and nephew who are doing well like i i kind of like the present it's a good answer to me <laughs> i guess so but i, I don't want to like dodge your question but oh, that's fine. Hmm. um now your character lucas um are you able to tell us if he'll be back in the second season i know you just wrapped up shooting season one well if we're blessed and lucky enough to get a second season uh i hope that i'm back in the second season, but I can't say for sure. And my like spoiler brain is going right now. And I'm like, am I allowed to even say anything? But I hope that I'm back in the second season, but I, you'll have to watch the episodes to find out. Makes sense. Now, do you know if it's being picked up in the States? We're hoping for American distribution. I haven't got official word yet, but as I'm sure you've read, like we've been really fortunate. The numbers have been through the roof. We had 900,000 viewers for the first episode. Which is crazy in Canada. But like the the number one show on showcase is Lost Girl and I think they get about three hundred thousand a week. So we like got three times as many viewers as the number one show on the network, which is insane. And then the second episode, like you you always lose some viewers from the first episode, obviously because the first one is all the promo the promo and stuff. But we had almost like seven hundred thousand for the second episode. So like it can't be going better. Like if, if we're we're going to get an American distributor, like everything is falling into place. We just have to hope have to hope that somebody steps up and picks us up. So And obviously, you know, the more the more episodes that come on, the more word of mouth people are gonna be talking about it, you're gonna get more and more views. So I can't see it going any other way really. I hope. Hopefully people aren't like, oh episode two is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt that very much. Now can you tell me um when when you're in limbo from season one to season two, if there is a season two um, what do you do with your time? It's funny. My mom just asked me that er, like an hour ago and she actually used the term limbo too. Nice. So I was like, limbo, that sounds so <laughs> dire. Like, <laughs> but, um, I mean, I, I, I'm a stand up comic also. Uh, I do slam poetry. And as we talked about before, I'm a writer. So like, and this came from like years and years of being so inexplicably broke that I was just like, what am I going to do? I need something to do. So I just, uh, in terms of artistry, I got into a bunch of different fields, so I would always be busy and have different uh, venues to make money. And I also do uh, voices for cartoons, so that's been keeping me busy, too. What's the favorite cartoon that you've done a voice for? Well, the only cartoon, really. I, I've done some video games as well and, like, audiobooks. I can't get into too much detail about it, but I can say that I'm currently doing a voice on a new show uh, called Max Steel. And that's all I can really say about it. Max Steel's like a superhero, right? Yeah, it's a superhero show. And uh, I got a pretty cool part in the, the new Max Steel show. Well, congratulations. Thanks. Um, speaking of parts, you've got two auditions coming up, yeah. um, which you only just found out about. Like 10 minutes ago, yeah. Are you able to tell me anything about them, or are you a person that doesn't want to jinx anything? 
Oh no, I don't. You know, I don't think that there's there's jinx in that. I don't mind. Uh, one of them is this really fun kid show called Level Up, and I'd be playing uh, this like kind of super passive aggressive teacher who's just like angry and hates his life, which would be really fun to play. <laughs> and the other is like a, a movie of the week. Like I play a guy whose girlfriend had a kid, and you know, movies of the week are. It's all very it's all very dramatic. <laughs> so how do you prepare for roles? I I really don't have like a specific process to be honest with you. I just try to like envision myself in characters and and obviously you know do all the homework about like what's my motivation what's my objective all the school and stuff but really i think what it usually comes down to is just like doing your preparation and just being relaxed enough in the room to not like completely sabotage your own performance <laughs> now if you have two auditions come up in the same day which i know you do tomorrow yeah, yeah. um how do you keep everything so separate have you ever been in a position where you've mixed two roles up huh it's interesting i I haven't. The The closest I ever came to doing that was when I was like 20, I did a play once called uh, The Crossroads in English and Le Carrefour in French, which was at Black Theatre Workshop in Montreal. And one day we actually had a matinee in English and then a night show in French. So that was the weirdest thing. Like It was the same character, but it was like the weirdest play experience or like acting experience where I was like, sometimes I would think to myself, am I going to, should I say this in French or English? Like, yeah. So that was weird, but I've never really mixed up characters and stuff. Trying to make the translation, though, that must... I mean, I know I speak a couple different languages, but I tried to learn more. And you're constantly going from, if you learn English first, English to French to Spanish, then to Italian. Totally. Like, you're, you have to cross over so many different paths. That must have been a difficult task. Yeah, it was brutal. <laughs> <laughs> I was young and dumb enough to be like, oh, I could do this, like... I don't know. When you're when you're starting off as an actor, you just want to like prove that you can get hired, and you're really like just being like, yeah, I can do anything. Like everybody wants to be Robert De Niro, and like, oh, if he could starve himself, then I can do a, a show in two languages. But now that I'm 32, I'm like, that's insane. I would never do that again. <laughs> but you work. did it. You got through it, and now look at you. You're on continuum. I guess so. Yeah, I guess so. Although I don't know if there's a correlation between the two. I just got lucky, I think. But I'd say it's hard work. Now, I have one more question for you. Sure. Um, I know you said you've watched a couple of my interviews, so you probably know it's coming. Um, I ask everyone about their socks. About their socks? Yes. What do you want to know about the socks? I would like to know what uh, sock choice you made today. What okay. socks are you wearing? Do you want to see them or just hear about them? I would love to see them if you'd be willing. I'm scared. i got to make sure i got my socks going right. Oh, okay, good. I did the classic cut-off black sports sock, courtesy of Foot Locker. Uh, so just, uh, yeah, I usually wear those so I don't look like the old guy at the gym with the high, <laughs> high knee Hold socks. Knees, yeah. Yep. Now, why black? Uh, honestly, I usually go to Foot Locker and every time I'm in there, I'll just buy a bunch of socks because I don't know if you have this problem, but like my closet just eats socks. <laughs> okay. Like it's bizarre. I just lose socks and have odd ends of socks. So every time I go by Foot Locker, I just buy socks and the black ones are right by the front. So. Okay. I've actually had that conversation with people about how socks just randomly go missing, and we've come to the conclusion they're sock gnomes. It's a conspiracy, I think. You know what? And to go back to an earlier question, if I could go back in time, I would go back in time to, like, the day before I lose pairs of socks so I can recollect all my... So it wouldn't be one day. I would just track all the socks I've lost over the years, and I could make a million dollars reselling them on the used sock market. I like it. And uh, most of your socks are black, so I'm assuming you don't mismatch. No, I know I don't. I do have some white ones, too, because uh, just for some variation, but most of my socks are, in fact, black. And you would never wear a black and a white? At the same time? Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's been done. There was some dark years in college where <laughs> coffee filters were used for bizarre purposes and socks were like whatever's available, so I'm sure it's been done. You do what you got to do. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you. Pleasure meeting you. Pleasure meeting you too. Thanks.